All right, so I suggest we start. Um, welcome everyone uh, to our research user group uh, meeting. Um, I don't see any specific items in the agenda apart from our topic. So today we'll we'll hear about the Crosspoint project, and we have Nick uh, Cope from Upbound to to introduce the project and uh, answer our questions. So uh, I won't uh, hold any longer. Thanks a lot again, Nick, for doing this, and uh, yeah, it's your floor. Thank you. All right, just uh, share. Yeah, it, it's breaking a bit, at least for me, the, the microphone. But um, I think if you if you speak, uh, it should be a bit better. Can you give it a go? Uh, any better? I, I think it's. Yeah. Sounding a little bit better to me now. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, that's yeah. better. It was noise cancelling before. Um, every time you'd speak, it would cut yourself out. <laughs> so. It was, right. it was pretty awesome. Look, looks looks good now. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Sweet. Give me just a second to try and drag my windows around so that I can uh, <laughs> share the screen without you seeing all of my speaker notes in my own thing. As far It's, it's breaking up again, Nick. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but the, the, the sharing is good. It's just uh, the sound is breaking up again. It, yeah. uh, I, I don't have this problem on any other media app, to be honest. Uh, let me, let's try and rejoin a different browser and see if that It might be that if you keep talking, it will calm down. If it's just noise cancellation. Let's give it a go. Because at some point, it was very good. not working. I'm going to try and join from Chrome uh, instead of Safari and see if that's any better. Sorry. Cool. Right. In the meantime, I see Antonio joined and I see him for the first time here. So maybe Antonio, do you want to, uh, he doesn't seem to have a microphone though, but uh, in any case, if you want to say hi and or, or paste in the chat. Uh, I don't know if. Yeah. <laughs> okay. In the meantime, we can wait for uh, for Nick to join.
Yeah, it was weird. Um, it was something like he would speak and then whatever noise cancellation thing this yeah. platform is doing would go, oh, wait, I've heard this before. I should cut it out. And so every other second, it was noise canceling itself, which was pretty awesome. Yeah, let's see. I'm sure, he will join again. We need to see a uh, DJ set that actually takes use of that and can make some cool sounds. Uh, oh, but uh, exactly <laughs> yeah. yeah, Zoom magicians I've seen. I have not seen a Zoom DJ yet, but uh, you know, <laughs> never say never. <laughs> Well, I keep saying that we need Jamie and his uh, jazz uh, jamming skills to, to <laughs> entertain us for these breaks. It's like productions, mm -hmm. like improv, and then there you go. Go ahead, that's your moment. That, that's it. <laughs> it's your it's your moment. He's been uh, delaying his his uh, his event, but he will have to do it at some point. Be exciting. All right, I'm trying to catch Nichols on Slack to see if he needs help. Anyone using crossplane while we wait? We can already start. Let's give it the people here. Ah, oh, he's back. Okay, let's give this another go. That's much better. I'd make, a UDP, I'd make a UDP joke right now, but y'all might not get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I recently switched from Chrome to Safari, and I like Safari a lot more, but I'm finding that a lot of the internet is built for Chrome rather than Safari. So, <laughs> uh, All right, let me get my presentation going again. I have to quit and reopen my browser to have security permission to share a window. Sorry, folks. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> yeah, so I was about to add, like, we, we do, we, we've been using Crossplane, but only for integrating with public clouds. Uh, and we've tried the providers for pretty much all the major public cloud providers. And we use it actually to deploy Kubernetes clusters. So we manage the clusters at the different uh, clouds from within a non-premises Kubernetes cluster and we just orchestrate the remote ones using Crossplane and it's used, it works pretty well. I'm excited about hearing about it. at that in, in this browser 
There we go. Share just a window with you instead of my whole display. <laughs> All right. Uh, we are now good to go. Thanks for bearing with me, folks. All right. So uh, my name is Nick Cope. I am a uh, steering committee member on the uh, Crossplane project. I've been working on the project for about three years. Uh, I actually started working on it right after the founders uh, of the project, the same people who founded the Rook uh, CNCF graduated project. Uh, shipped the 0.1 release which was uh, very much a tech demo and then uh, it continued to be a tech demo for some time uh, through to our 1.0 release uh, which i want to say was uh, late uh, 2020. all right so what what is crossplane uh, we think of crossplane as being a, a framework for building control planes or api centric control planes uh, specifically so uh, so what does that mean uh, Think of think of crossplane as an interface to your platform. So your platform uh, could be a lot of things uh, to a lot of different people, which can mean both what is your platform for? Is it for um, uh, is it a platform for application developers to quickly ship apps, sort of a PaaS or internal PaaS type of system? Is it a machine learning platform? Is it sort of a mini internal cloud platform? Um, and it can also mean what is it what is it made of? What is it powered by? So you know, for a lot of folks, it is a cloud provider like AWS or Azure. Um, it could be on-prem uh, hardware. Could be uh, other sort of supporting services like GitHub, ServiceNow, etc. So many of these uh, many of these things expose APIs, but they're kind of one size fits all. So Amazon, for example, if they're designing an API like the one you can see here uh, for RDS, folks request and manage database instances. They uh, inherently, you know, they have lots and lots of customers and they want to design an API that has all the features that all those customers want and that suits everyone. So it's very powerful, but it's kind of one size fits all. And uh, in our experience, that can be somewhat overwhelming, especially if you are a platform team or SRE team in an organization building, uh, building a platform for your application developers. They may not want to think about all these fields. Uh, it might be sort of a way too much sort of cognitive burden, way too much for them to learn when they just want to focus on, on what they want to do, which is you know, probably have somewhere to store their data in this case to, or they uh, build and run their app. And you may not want them to have access to all those things. You know, there might be there might be fields that you want to set as a policy, as it were, sort of thing to uh, to control. So that's that's really what Crossplane does. It takes anything with an API, brings it into a control plane, which is built on the Kubernetes control plane uh, declaratively. But then, what really I think makes Crossplane special is that it lets you define your own APIs on top of those, your own sort of API abstraction. So you can present things to your customers uh, however you like. And again, when I talk about you and your customers, or I'll talk about the persona of uh, platform curator and platform consumer, I'm talking about uh, usually you as a platform team member or SRE, someone who's supporting application developers in an org, and then your sort of consumers and customers are... Uh, application developers. So this is an example of uh, basically what you saw on the previous slide. Uh, so in, in this previous slide, you're seeing uh, an example of YAML. Uh, and you know, I, I don't, everyone, everyone uh, disses YAML in the Kubernetes. It's kind of a cool thing to do these days, but you can just think of it as a REST API really, you know, behind the scenes, what it's doing is taking this YAML document confer with you know transforming it into a into a rest call effectively and uh you know i think uh, i think rest apis are a pretty powerful generic uh, uh interface so this next slide here is an example of what you just saw uh as it regards to crossplane concepts behind the scenes so what crossplane is actually doing here is taking what we would call a claim this postgres instance turning it into an intermediary object called a composite resource which in turn gets uh, rendered out into a couple of uh, specific cloud resources like RDS and in this case, a database parameter group. This is a little bit of a more detailed view of the same thing that illustrates some of those concepts uh, a little bit more. 
So again, you've got the claim and the composite resource and manage resources. So again, remember that the claim would be the uh, Postgres instance in the previous uh, slide. Uh, the managed resources would be RDS database subnet group in, in this example. So some of the new things that you see introduced here are more sort of platform team, more platform curator uh, concerns. You have the composite resource definition or XRD, and you have the composition. These, are, these all sort of configure what your platform can do. So the composite resource definition teaches Crossplane that a particular type of composite resource now exists. In this case, the uh, X PostgreSQL instance. It also teaches it that a new type of claim exists because those two objects are, are tightly coupled. The two types are, uh, go hand in hand. Crossplane then needs to know what to do if someone creates one of those claims. So if someone says, hey, I'd like a Postgres instance, it has to know, oh, that means I should go create an RDS instance or I should uh, you know, create a DB subnet group or maybe it should be you know, using a different cloud. It should be using a Cloud SQL instance in, in Google or you know, again, maybe it should be using some sort of on-prem system with an API to spin up a database. So that's where compositions come in. Compositions are effectively a sort of a template or policy saying, okay, uh, pick, pick this one and it'll tell you how to fill in the blanks. So what I mean by fill in the blanks is going back to this example, you can see here that the only field that we have on the Postgres instance here is storage. Uh, and you should ignore the fact that storage is actually 20 gigs over here. I realized that after I took the uh, screenshot, pretend that, they're, pretend that they're both 100 gigs. But all these other fields have to come from somewhere. And if they're not sort of uh, specified here in the Postgres instance, that, that you know has to be a different resource. And you can almost think of the Postgres instances configuration fields then being overlaid on top of the RDS instance. So that's all done with a composition. And one of the interesting things is that there is a uh, one to many composite resource type to composition relationship. So that, or another way of saying that is for any particular type of composite resource for this Postgres instance, you could have many compositions. You could have the Azure one and the AWS one. You could have the big one and the small one. You could have the East Coast and the West Coast one or something like that. And that can take many fields and just fundamentally what the thing is made up of, whether it's RDS or Cloud SQL or something else, and effectively make that a single knob uh, to, your, uh, to your people consuming your platform, to the application developers. At that point, they're really just matching on labels uh, similar to a Kubernetes pod matching a node. They could say, give me the West Coast composition, please. Or they could add, they could say, give me the West Coast production composition, please. Or give me the West Coast production AWS composition, please. And uh, uh, by specifying labels, uh, they will get they will get the right one. And uh, as you can see, I think this uh, dotted line in the middle sort of shows that everything above the line is what we think of as a consumer concern, an app team concern. Everything below the line is more of the person who's sort of configuring the platform, probably the platform team. I use platform and control plane somewhat. Uh, uh, to mean the same thing. I would typically think of your platform as having sort of one or more control planes as, as the interface. So this is sort of a quick slide on what crossplane is made up of. So what are the moving parts? We have core, which is if you go to github.com slash crossplane slash crossplane and sort of follow the instructions to uh, to install Crossplane itself, that is what you'll end up with. And really Crossplane Core is, is two things. It is the parts of the code base that power composition. So that's, that's this stuff, that's the feature that allows you to have composite resources and claims. And it's a package manager that lets you install extensions. So funnily enough, if you just install Crossplane Core and then stop there, it doesn't actually do anything. It really is kind of just a framework that you then have to go configure to uh, to, to do anything uh, useful. So the package manager lets you install Crossplane extensions. We uh, use a package format called uh, XPackage, which is just a, a simple uh, uh, OCI-based uh, packaging format. And today, the things that you can extend Crossplane with are providers and configurations. Providers teach Crossplane about managed resources. So that teaches Crossplane about these managed resources down the bottom, which again are things like RDS, DB subnet group, Cloud SQL instances. 
providers tend to be focused or packaged, uh, you know, uh, based on a, a product or a cloud. So we have an AWS provider, we have a Google provider, we have a SQL provider for, uh, for actually, you know, speaking SQL as an API to create databases, uses things like that. We have a Terraform provider, which is a little bit of an inception thing, which is a provider for crossplay that goes and runs Terraform uh, configurations. Uh, we have a Domino's Pizza provider that can go and uh, one of our product managers at uh, Upbound made to uh, <laughs> to order pizza. Is it something that you always have to do if you're making a making an infrastructure tool? Apparently. And then, so that's providers. We also have configurations. Configurations extend crossplane uh, with support for new composite resources. So that is uh, composite resources and claims. Configurations will actually typically drop in composite resource definitions, XRD. I think we lost him. <laughs> no, it was sounding so good. It was brilliant. Uh, and I'm oh, he's back. Oh, I might Is actually it... need to to drop off. Somebody's requesting my time, so I might just yeah. see me wander away. Uh, sorry. Thanks for for sure for attending. Yeah, Nick is back. Yeah, glad to have you back, Nick. It was it was looking good. Thanks for what it's worth. This is. Uh... This is this is not a common problem. This is very. <laughs> to, uh... I'm just I'm just looking forward. If you start doing a live demo, like the gods are oh, definitely yeah. not with you today. No, no, uh, no live demo <laughs> today. All right. So where was I? I was uh, I was just pointing out that uh, providers uh, add support for new managed resources. Configurations add support for new composite resources. So you can actually just define a composite resource directly by just authoring an XRD and applying it to your cluster and authoring compositions and applying it to your cluster. But if you need to go and uh, sort of share the same configuration, that, you know, you, let's say you define your Postgres instance type and then you actually have 10 control planes you want to go and ship that type to, then packaging them up as a configuration can be a handy thing to do to just uh, distribute them out to everything that you can version that um, configurations can have dependencies on providers. So you can say this configuration needs the AWS provider and the Google provider and Crossplane will automatically install all of that. So it's kind of just a convenience thing for distributing Crossplane configuration. Uh, some of the stuff that we have in the works that we think of as Crossplane extensions that will likely be packaged up uh, as well soon are secret stores. So that is a way to uh, teach Crossplane when I create something like uh, the Postgres instance in the previous example, I might need to push connection details somewhere. I might need to say this is the this is the address that it's running at. This is a username and this is a password. Uh, we've always supported Kubernetes, just writing that to a secret. Uh, we now uh, have uh, alpha support for pushing to a vault as well, uh, and we're working on a sort of plugin based model, so you'll be able to teach Crossplane about more um, secret stores there. Uh, XRM functions uh, is is something that uh, that I think is pretty cool, which is uh, one one thing that we have heard and that we kind of were always conscious of with Crossplane is that the language used to configure composition is intentionally uh, limited. So it's effectively a template for a bunch of resources to go create. Uh, it does not support um, conditionals. It does not support iteration. There's no such thing as you know, if uh, if I put, you know, I can't put number of databases 23 on my uh, XR and have crossplay and go and be like, oh, great, I have to go and create 23 instances of this this database that we effectively did not want to build a uh, sort of programming language as a REST API. So what we're, what we're working on at the moment is the ability to mix and match the current version of composition with effectively a pipeline of simple functions where you can basically say, hey, Crossplane, when you see uh, a composite resource that looks like this, uh, execute this pipeline of little OCI images, basically, uh, each of which is a, is a function that tells Crossplane what to do, or call that to a webhook, potentially, uh, very similar to uh, KPT or Customize, taking a lot of inspiration from KRM functions, if you've used those. Uh, coming soon, also uh, webhooks. We're uh, adding pluggable webhook support to this. Uh, some of those webhooks are probably going to be built in, so there's going to be things like 
validation of core crossplane types, but we're hoping to allow you to also, you know, add your own bespoke webhooks so that you can sort of add your own uh, uh, sort of uh, validation admission control webhooks for your composite resources. For example, if there should be some extra policy applied or, you know, you want some second order effects to happen when one of those is created. This is just an example of some of the managed resources that we have in the AWS provider today. Um, uh, we have uh, we have an AWS provider at this point that has, I think, 700 of them or something like that. A uh, little bit of a taste of our roadmap at the moment. There is a roadmap on the github.com uh, slash crossplane org. Uh, I mentioned the pluggable secret stores that we're working on. Custom compositions is another name for those uh, XRM functions I talked about. Validations relates to the webhooks. Also, uh, looking into just improving our support for Argo CD. A lot of people use crossplane with Argo CD, and there's a few bugs at the moment that make that a, a less than optimal experience. So, we're going to uh, work with the Argo CD folks uh, on that. Uh, and another uh, thing that's in quite, demand, uh, quite a lot of demand is uh, observe only resources, as we call them, which is the idea that maybe you want some uh, stuff to be represented in crossplane that is uh, the crossplane isn't authoritative, isn't, isn't declarative for. So you might want to refer to a piece of infrastructure, pull in some data from it, and use it somewhere else uh, in a, in a read-only, in an observe-only fashion. I think that's kind of the end of the, uh, the presentation uh, for the moment. But one other thing that I want to uh, point out that's uh, not worked into these slides is that uh, if you... In all of our examples here, we... Uh, we tend to talk about crossplane as uh, uh, being used for infrastructure constructs, like Postgres instances in this case. We're increasingly seeing folks use crossplane for, and uh, we just haven't got a lot of uh, demos of this at the moment. But people ask us, you know, what what app model should I use with crossplane? What should uh, you know should I use crossplane together with Kubevel or something like that, or some some other sort of uh, simplified application model, uh, especially if I'm if, if I'm installing Crossplane uh, as an add-on to Kubernetes rather than as a standalone control plane. And, uh, you know, being based on Kubernetes, it is compatible with with uh, sort of any of those things. And then, you know, if you if you like one of those uh, app models, you are more than welcome to, to use it with Crossplane. So it should work really well. But we also think Crossplane is a way to build your own app model. Uh, it was at an open source symposium uh, run by uh, some Amazon folks uh, the other week. And some of the people on stage were talking about how it's it's similarly to the fact that it's really tough for anyone to design the one true Postgres API that just works for every company, every organization, you know, every lab. It's tough to do that for, you know, the one true application model as well. And the nice thing about Crossplane's sort of composite resource system is that it is pretty open-ended. You could use this to define a composite resource that represented an app. We went and used our plugins for uh, our providers for Helm or Kubernetes or EC2 instances, etc., to go and actually spin up workloads somewhere and potentially also spin up the databases and queues and all the things that, uh, that that needs behind the scenes. So that's something that uh, is possible today, and we just need to do a bit of work to sort of document that fact and sort of highlight it to folks and give give some examples to get folks thinking. All right. Anyway, I will uh, I will stop presenting at you now and uh, open the floor to uh, questions and discussion. Awesome, uh, thanks a lot, Nick. Uh, I'm looking here, so if anyone has questions, uh, feel free to come forward. Can you just do a simple comparison with some of the other competing tools in this space, like um, something that would come from HashiCore uh, or for some, from some other large organization? How, how do they compare and contrast? Yeah, sure. Um, I think that the shooting from the hip, the things that we see people comparing crossplane with uh, the most often are Terraform. Um, we also see people uh, comparing crossplane with some of the cloud provider based um, sort of declarative Kubernetes configuration tools. So that would be um, Amazon's ACK, Amazon controls for Kubernetes, uh, the Azure service operator and uh, Google's uh, Config Connector. Uh, Terraform, uh, especially if we talk here just in um, you know pure open source world, so I'm not considering Terraform cloud and enterprise and things like that while comparing to crossplane. Um, 
because those are proprietary. There's a, a couple of differences. One is uh, more of a more of a community based thing. Crossplay is part of the CNCF. We are an open governance uh, uh, project. Uh, we do happen. We were founded by Upbound, which is where I work, and we do have a lot of Upbound folks working on it. But we have a steering committee that is open to people who are not Upbound uh, employees. We have maintainers who are not Upbound employees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, whereas uh, Terraform is open source, but it is is not open governance. It is a, a HashiCorp driven uh, project. But uh, putting aside, you know how their communities run. Uh, so I guess the summary there is: we think of you know organizationally, we're much more like sort of Kubernetes and all the great CNCF projects than, than HashiCorp. But technologically, um, I would say HashiCorp is an IAC tool, right? So it's a command line tool that is one shot. Cross plane gets installed uh, uh, onto a Kubernetes control plane, typically. Uh, we're increasingly promoting a model where you could actually just go and install like a really a really small Kubernetes control plane that doesn't actually run your controllers and doesn't run all of your uh, sorry doesn't run your controllers doesn't run your pods that is just sort of standalone as a place to run cross plane separately from maybe all of your app clusters that you run sort of Kubernetes apps on, but you could also install cross plane just as an add on to a Kubernetes cluster. So the point here is that uh, you know if you think about all the benefits that you get from Kubernetes, like uh, you declaratively say, hey, this pod should be running. And if the pod stops running Kubernetes, you can try really hard to get it running again. Crossplay does that for everything it manages as well. So if you say, hey, Crossplay, and I need this Postgres instance, and that Postgres instance stops running, Crossplay will keep trying to run it. Uh, you know, and Terraform does that as well, but it's typically reliant on you have to go and invoke Terraform at, uh, you know, so you've at that point got to put it in a cron job or put it in CICD or some way to get Terraform to so that you know keep checking in and, uh, and correcting any drift in your infrastructure um another thing is that just uh, slight design differences and this is a this is a sort of a, a trade-offs thing uh terraform uh very thoroughly creates a, a graph of all of your resources it computes everything and that could end up with some challenges where uh, if, if you just sort of model all of your infrastructure as one Terraform configuration, you might want to say, hey, Terraform, please go uh, update this database for me. But then someone's changed your buckets out of, out of uh, you know, band as well. And Terraform's like, well, I just have to fix everything. So I'm going to change the buckets and I'm going to change your uh, databases as well. That happens less with Crossplane just because you really can't change things out of, uh, uh, out of band with Crossplane because it's going to immediately notice and change them back. Uh, but we also designed Crossplane in a somewhat lazy, more Kubernetes-like fashion where it's it's all very um, decoupled and asynchronous from each other. So there's, you know, if you want to just go change a database, there's like no forced relationship on, uh, on, on you know, anything else that your infrastructure is uh, doing there. Uh, so that's sort of uh, the, the medium depth uh, comparison to Terraform. The comparison I'd say to all of the uh, various cloud provider uh, uh, you know, uh, Kubernetes controller uh, projects is, uh, it varies. Uh, notably, the Google one is not open source uh, at all. Uh, and uh, so most of the cloud provider ones, again, not really community driven, are uh, owned by their vendor. So you've really got to go sort of uh, work with uh, work with the cloud providers to get features added or uh, bug fixes, et cetera, et cetera. But they all are single vendor. They focus only on their cloud. So uh, if you are, if you are, you know, want a provider for, you know, want, want support for managing GitHub repositories or something that falls outside of a cloud provider, you kind of have to go find some other sort of controller uh, or operator there. You could, let's say, you are in all of the big three clouds and a few other things. You could install all of those operators, all of those controller sets and then install operators for all these other things. But then you have a somewhat disjoint set of tools that all are like kind of the same. They're all in the Kubernetes ecosystem, but there's subtle differences between them. In Crossplane, we have what we think of as the XRM, the Crossplane resource model, which says anything that our provider drops in should write connection details in a standard way, should have a standard uh, sort of overall shape of its API for how the spec and status is laid out, things like that. Uh, should have standard status conditions so that you can tell when they're healthy and when they're not healthy, have standard uh, annotations for importing existing resources, things like that. So with Crossplane, you get the kind of benefit that no matter what backend API you're on, things will work similarly, like all the APIs will, will seem familiar to you. And then again, the real uh, benefit, I think, with Crossplane is that 
it has this abstraction layer on top of it. If you go and install Amazon controllers for Kubernetes, you're really just taking the AWS API and putting it in Kubernetes. It doesn't simplify much compared to just doing a REST call to Amazon's API to create a database. You're just doing a REST call to the Kubernetes API to make a database. Uh, whereas with Crossplay, you can define your own API on top of that, as I showed in one of my earlier slides, that sort of uh, gives you know, wraps that up in your opinions. So if your developers, yeah, I, I worked at I worked at Spotify for a long time, and uh, one of the projects I worked on was uh, before Spotify was in the cloud was their um, machine provisioning system. And when we moved to the cloud, one thing that was that we were conscious of in the early days was that developers already had a mental model from our previous system that we'd built of what machines were. They didn't think in like Amazon terms, they thought in Spotify terms of like machine sizes and features and things like that. So, you know, in that example, something like Crossplane would help a lot because you could just move to the cloud and just keep the same abstraction sort of thing as like a, as a layer. And this is something we see anyone who thinks of themselves as a platform team and many people who think of themselves as an SRE is doing at the moment. They're, they're really trying to build sort of a layer between the people that they support their customers and the sort of huge amount of infrastructure that they run so that they can kind of present it in a, in a slightly more user-friendly and controlled way. And that's that's really what Crossplane does that things like ACK, in my opinion, don't do. We do love ACK though, we work with their team and we actually share a code generation pipeline with them. So there is, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, camaraderie between us and the uh, folks who work on, uh, you know, ACK, ASO, KCC, et cetera. We've done talks together and we, you know, chat and swap notes every now and again. Uh, yeah, that's my summary of other tools in the space. Let me know if I uh, uh, forgot any. <laughs> All right, thanks for doing that. Taylor? Thank you. Th yep. Yeah, I, I had one question. Um, it, you you kind of hit on this already in, in terms of like setting up that mini cluster um, and, you know, using uh, installing control plane there and then using that to manage some of your other concepts and, and constructs. Um, have you seen any other patterns that have developed in using cross plane uh, in this way, like GitOps? You know, you've seen like app of apps and all these other ways in which to manage things. Um, have you seen uh, interesting ways or, or you know typical ways that people typically set this up in their cluster or within their their uh, environments? Probably the most emergent way is uh, is sort of the idea of a standalone or central control plane. Um, uh, especially in really large orgs, um, we'll see folks wanting to use crossplane uh, for kind of everything. So they'll want to use crossplane to go and deploy all of their clusters in the first place. So let's say they, you know, they've got 20 clusters for, around the world for whatever reasons, or they might give a cluster to each sort of department or team or something like that for, for running apps on. And they might want those clusters to have Argo CD installed, have, you know, maybe Prometheus installed and a few other, you know, a, a service mesh or something. Um, they, they like crossplay because they can have crossplay and go and create the cluster in the first place. So go and create an EKS cluster or a GKE cluster or whatever we have support for provider wise. And then they can also use crossplay uh, without providers for Helm and Kubernetes to go and declaratively install Argo CD or uh, you know any of the other tools that they want onto that cluster. And then they can use crossplay in the central crossplay to also install crossplay onto those clusters. <laughs> and have folks over there use crossplane uh, in that cluster to sort of manage their you know, infrastructure apps, whatever they uh, to try to try to do with that. Um, so this is this is something that, uh, that there isn't a one of the questions in chat was uh, you know uh, is this possible today? Yes, it is possible. There isn't much in the way of sort of special tooling for it yet, but you can really think of this as like process wise, you know, spin up a spin up a relatively small cluster, however you like to, you know, however your org spins up clusters, um, you know, be it in the cloud or, uh, or on-prem, doesn't need to be particularly huge because Crossplane isn't particularly resource intensive. You're not going to have a lot of nodes in your clusters. You are going to have a lot of CRDs instantly, which is a, uh, which is actually one of our biggest challenges in Crossplane at the moment. We're hitting the scaling limits of, of Kubernetes CRD-wise. It turns out if you have more than like 100 or 200 CRDs, uh, the, the API server was not designed for that. So we're uh, working with uh, folks in the upstream uh, sort of, uh, Kubernetes community to try and make that better. Um, but, you know, spin up a relatively small control plane, install crossplane into it, uh, and you're kind of done. You know, then just by convention, don't use that one to go run, you know, 
random pods and instead use it to spin up other control planes, other other API servers, and uh, you know use those as your Kubernetes clusters. Amazing, amazing, cool. No, that that totally makes sense to me, and and, and kind of like what you said before too, around like Terraform and everything else. Um, I know, I know, <laughs> I know the industry always loves an us first them story, but I've I've been able to use uh, Terraform with Crossplane, and then kind of like use Terraform to get up to the bounds of instanti instantiation, and then use Crossplane and Flux and Argo and all those things like to to handle those downstream things too. So really interesting to see how everybody's using the different tools within the space. And uh, yeah, I appreciate it, Nick. Thank you. That's fantastic. Yeah. No I, you know, I haven't used uh, Terraform in a, in a little while, just, you know, for, for obvious reasons, because I, you know, have my new tool of choice, but I uh, <laughs> contributed to Terraform before I uh, ever worked at Crossplay, and I really love the project, and it's, it's, it is pretty funny, because I, you could totally have a Crossplay provider for Terraform, and then you could have, you know, Crossplay calling Terraform, calling Crossplay and calling Terraform, and make yourself a nice endless loop or something. <laughs> it's, I got to work on that. That's going to be my next Hack Day project. <laughs> Right. Thanks. Uh, I actually have a kind of a follow up question. You, you mentioned like we were discussing about having composition and having crossplane doing the composition. Uh, in, in our case, we actually use crossplane mostly to deploy the low level stuff like the clusters themselves, like what you were saying, having a central cluster uh, that then manages multiple clusters in different clouds, different regions, and maybe the S3 buckets you need or something like that. And we actually do that using Argo. So we basically have Argo, Argo CD resources that are cross-plane clusters uh, using the uh, GCP provider or, or, or uh, AWS or whatever. You, you mentioned there's work ongoing to integrate Argo CD with cross-plane a bit better. Uh, what, what is that exactly? Because what, one thing we had issues with is, for example, if we deploy those clusters, using um, Argo CD, you can't really register those clusters to then deploy additional resources in the same Argo CD instance. Um, it's, it's not trivial because uh, like Argo CD has some logic on how to manage multi-cluster deployments from a single instance. And if you're deploying the clusters themselves using Crossplane as uh, inside the same Argo CD instance, it was kind of a loop. And we have a kind of hacky way of registering those is this the kind of thing that is being worked on i that doesn't ring a bell um it might be i i will say i'm not the biggest expert in argo cd it's not something mm -hmm. that i personally use a, a ton um i we have a uh, we have an issue on on crossplane slash crossplane which uh is titled something along the lines of uh, crossplane should play nice with argo cd uh and that is sort of our parent issue for some of the little bugs that we've we've noticed. So some of the things that I can say are, uh, are missing at the moment, if I understand correctly, is that uh, Argo CD does not have a concept of readiness for most cross-plane resources. And this, I think, is, I actually just pinged uh, uh, one of the folks from Acuity the other day, one of the Argo uh, project uh, uh, leads, uh, to start talking about this. I've been meaning to reach out to them for a while to swap notes because my understanding is that that might be best fixed in Argo City. I think Argo City basically has a, um, a, a big configurable set of types and then you can teach it what status conditions for those types mean they're healthy. But with mm -hmm. Crossplane, when we have literally hundreds or thousands of managed resources, that's a lot of configuration to add to Argo CD. And then on top of that, if people are just defining their own arbitrary types, they probably can't reconfigure Argo CD for all of those. So I was considering uh, asking the Argo City folks how they feel about adopting the key status emergent spec, which really just says, amongst a few other things, if you have a status condition called ready, <laughs> then consider that, to, and nothing else, consider that to be the thing being ready. Uh, I think another thing was that there is some um, label copying that we automatically do between crossplane claims and crossplane uh, composite resources that confuses Argo CD because Argo CD will manage a claim and it'll add a label to that claim to say, hey, I'm, I manage my Argo CD, and we'll just copy that over the composite resource. And then Argo CD is like, I'm managing this composite resource, but I didn't create it. So I guess I got to delete it or whatever. So uh, okay. so some of these things I think need to be fixed. You know, the, the first example there, I think needs to be fixed in Argo CD. The second example probably needs to be fixed in Crossplane. So uh, step one is going to be just talking to the Argo City folks about the issues we're seeing and getting their uh, opinion on, on these things to figure out where we fix them and how. Interesting. 
Yeah, and and maybe a, also a related question is uh, regarding uh, secrets. You you mentioned integration with uh, external secret stores. But there's like a ton of ways of managing secrets uh, on the wool stack, depending on how you look at things. Like Argo CD also uh, coming back to the integration with Flux or Argo CD, they both have also their ways of you know, handling secrets, also external secrets. So like where if you would use some of these tools to manage your cross-plane deployments, where would the secret management be at? Or is there like a best practice on how to manage all of this? No, I, I don't think I can say there is a best practice because it really depends from uh, from organization to organization. You know, I'm I'm one of these people who doesn't find Kubernetes secrets to be that bad sort of thing. I think a lot of people are like, wait, they're base 64 encoded at the API. Thou shall never use them sort of thing. I think there are some hardback issues and whatnot, but, uh, but you know, a lot of, you know, folks who are much more uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, opinionated and experienced with security than me, I'm sure will, will violently disagree. Um, and you know, different different orgs are going to have different policies. Some people are going to be well, you can only put it in Vault. Other people say you can only put it in uh, AWS's. Uh, I think it was called Key Manager or something like that. So our approach in Crossplane is to uh, we would like secret stores to become somewhat similar to providers, so that you you know you can kind of just plug in whatever makes sense for you there. Uh, with the current alpha implementation, uh, we we just uh, we effectively refactored the the API a little bit to be a little bit more generic. Previously, it was the API was was very um, uh, specific to Kubernetes secrets. Uh, so the, and that API still exists because it's part of the V1 API. So we're not going to get rid of it. But uh, we've sort of added a new field as an alpha field that, uh, that sort of speaks a little bit more generically about publishing connection details. Uh, that can uh, has a, a new type that's similar to provider config. If you've used provider config before, we now have a store config for uh, for where to store secrets, um, and that can be told. There's two in tree baked in ones at the moment. Uh, one is for Kubernetes, one's for Vault. Uh, the Kubernetes one can now publish secrets to a different cluster, which is convenient uh, if you if you have that kind of central control plane and you use that yep. for your infrastructure. You can say, hey, just go push Kubernetes right. secrets over there, which is kind of neat. Uh, the Vault one, we may take out and make that a plugin because we think that we'd like to sort of uh, package all of these things as, you know, you can drop it in and, and you know, if you, you know, if you use Vault something rather than uh, having it natively built in. So we'd sort of limit the native support for stuff that interacts with the Kubernetes API and then everything else would be a plugin. Uh, but it was a lot quicker to build it in uh, <laughs> natively for the alpha support. So, uh, so it's there for the time being. And uh, I know one of the other crossplay maintainers, uh, Hassan, is actually uh, prototyping um, uh, sort of a plugin based approach for secrets at the moment that would open up all those other ones. But as to, you know, which one you should use or how you should do it, all that kind of stuff, it's, it's kind of, I can't really tell you that. That's, uh, that's up to your org to, uh, to yeah. have on. Yeah, I, I ask this because in this group, like we, we try to come up with like best practices that will simplify research oriented deployments, but sometimes even the like the basic bits uh, also need some best practice re recommendation. But as you say, it really depends on, on the actual tooling being used. It's interesting, actually, because I my, my background is, you know, 10 or 15 years in platform and SRE, right? But then for the last three years, I've been building this cross-plane tooling, and I don't run cross-plane a lot myself to go do anything. So when it comes to learning the best, well, you know, I run it to develop cross-plane, but I'm yeah. not running the infrastructure anymore. So when it comes to what are the best practices when using crossplane, we really look to what is the community doing. So you know when I described that pattern of you know using a central control plane, like that's what we saw people doing. Um, you know I have coworkers at Upbound who use crossplane to run Upbound's infrastructure, so I look to them to tell me what the best practices are. Yeah. And the secret store support only shipped in like the most recent version of crossplane, so it's still kind of early days to get a signal on you know what the best practices about that are. Awesome. Yep. Any other question? Hi, Nick. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm, I'm having troubles getting my head around how the REST API is um, constructed. I mean, in my mind, they're, they're something that's normally hand built and crafted, and you have to define the different endpoints and what, what methods they accept. 
so in your example of Postgres there, how, how does the API to Postgres get constructed? Is it a matter of the difference between the provided um, annotations and what's missing? Or it that's a good question. Uh, and to answer, I'll ask another question. Uh, are you familiar with uh, CRDs or custom resource definitions in, uh, in Kubernetes at all? A little bit, yeah. Okay, so we, we basically extend those or, or use those as a framework. And so CRDs, when you install a CRD in the Kubernetes API, um, it kind of tells Kubernetes, hey, uh, I have this new type that I would like you to expose as part of your REST API, and here's kind of the, the open API schema for it. And then the Kubernetes API server is very clever and is capable of basically adding all those REST routes and methods and things like that uh, in order to accept requests for that. But then the API server is really just kind of a document store. So if you uh, can, like, create one of those things in the API server, it's really just going to go, all right, cool, I'll, I'll put that in etcd now and it's there and not do anything else. So crossplay and okay. had what we call an XRD, which is a, just a slight, like a superset of a CRD, almost slightly more opinionated, takes away some of the the uh, CRDs, in my opinion, were sort of really um, designed for a software engineer to go right, like it was designed for someone who's like building software on top of Kubernetes. So we tried to take away some of the weirder fields of CRD that maybe like sort of a, a, an operator doesn't care about that much, um, make it a little bit more opinionated. And then Crossplane has controllers that understand what an XRD is and so that will actually do something when you create one of those documents. So, so the API server then knows, oh, okay, I should create these routes and accept documents and accept REST requ requests basically with a certain shape. And then Crossplane also knows about those and sort of through the composition type, you can think of the composition type as kind of like a Helm chart, basically like the Helm templates and Helm chart, or like okay. uh, like the the the, uh, the HCL in a Terraform module sort of thing. It, it's kind of the thing that says what should what should Crossplane do when that REST API is called. And interestingly, what Crossplane typically does is like it sees a REST API getting called that's been defined, and it just makes calls back to Kubernetes to say, okay, create these other things in Kubernetes REST API, and then subsequent set of controllers go and create things in the external cloud, which is then nice because you kind of see the process of rendering as a series of sort of uh, documents in the API. You see the, the API that you made, you see that someone's called that and created a thing and you can sort of query that and list it. And then you can sort of query and list the intermediary things that Crossplane's rendered out and then, you know, Crossplane will go and call some other system to, to go and create that. Did that kind of make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. That filled in a big gap for me. Cool. Yeah. Right. All right. So I think we're getting to the end of the hour. So yeah, thanks again, Nick, for for this uh, like really nice overview. I'm sure I'm sure we'll keep we'll keep coming back to, to the project as people get more familiar with it. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, let us know if you'd like uh, if you have any more questions in future. And uh, uh, thanks for bearing with me with those technical detail uh, difficulties at the uh, beginning. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thanks a lot for 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 coming and talk to us. So for for I think we close here. We don't have anything else in the agenda. Uh, the next meeting will be in two weeks. Uh, the topic is on bare metal deployments. So uh, if anyone has, uh, we don't have a speaker yet. So if anyone has suggestions, feel free to ping uh, Jamie or myself. And uh, yeah, see you in two weeks. Thanks a lot, everyone, for attending. And thanks, Thank you, everybody. Have a good bye one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.